Welcome to the Boss It Weekly podcast. A no-nonsense, no-hype, frank, and close-up analysis of what is currently working and what is not in the world of software. The Boss It podcast is packed with major takeaways for software business owners and managers. So, let's begin. Welcome to another Boss It podcast. You will already see, hopefully, that there is a slight difference in the fact that nearly all of my recent podcasts over the last two seasons have been audio. And um, today, I, the, my guest is Minta Dial. So he's promised me this is going to be a great podcast. I've already had a good conversation with Minta, and I'm pretty confident it will be. But rather than me introducing him, because he knows him better than I do, is uh, let me pass you over to Minta and give us a quick background about Minta, about what you're all about. Well, I, I love the idea of trying to describe who I, I, I am. I mean, that's essentially <laughs> the whole nature of my last book, which is find out to be yourself. And, and the first thing I'd like to say is, I mean, I think that no one, not even I, has a perfect idea of exactly who I am. And, and so permission granted to have wobbles and foibles Yes. with regard to your own definition, but it is that the journey that's the most interesting one to gain fulfillment and energy. So who's Minta? Well, 56 years old, living in London, uh, an American citizen with a French passport, married to a French Spanish lady. I have the, um, I probably, not, not a privilege, but somehow title of having changed mid-year or professions 15 times, which essentially means I've done a lot of stuff, but I'm good at nothing. And I've changed countries 15 times in my life as well, and wow. I've learned a bunch of languages along the way. My The core part of my background was working at L'Oréal, the, the cosmetics company, for 16 years. But I've also worked in an investment bank. I started a travel agency for musicians. I was a teaching tennis pro, worked in a zoo and an aquarium. I've written a novel, a biography, three business books, and I produced a World War II documentary film. So a bunch of stuff. Um, I'll leave you to come up with what that all means. <laughs> well, I, I usually say that I've had got a very varied background, but I don't think it's quite as varied as that. Wow, that's great. So you've got a lot, lot to pull on from your experience. Um, I mean, that, that's an interesting point to, to start with and, and, and to discuss, I think, is that the, probably the modern career now is more diverse than it may be used to be 30 years ago. And I think probably before that with our parents' uh, generation, the idea was for a lot of people that they would start with a company and they would remain with that company for the rest of their career. Didn't always happen, but that was something that was seen as being quite possible. Whereas nowadays people do change more frequently. And I think that there are benefits for doing that. How have those changes affected you in, in the way that you, you handle business and life nowadays? All right. So the first thing I wanted to say was I think it's the most delightful concept of diversity. Because really, for me, especially when we're thinking about creating great teams, having diversity of backgrounds, diversity of opinions, mindsets is useful. We often talk about having like-minded people. But that actually can be a, a real impediment mm -hmm. for creating breakthroughs and stronger uh, businesses. So as far as I've, I, I'm concerned, what let's say that the changes have allowed me to explore so many different types of people. Let's just learning different languages means that there's a little bit of mental agility that has to go in to understand how to switch from one language to another, which isn't just the language, but the meaning, the cultural context, though even the way you use your hands has to be different. Yeah. So you have to be very observant of, about how others are, and, and that includes the way you listen, the accents, and so on and so forth. And then, and frankly, I, I mean, like, I, I studied literature at university. And, and so through the study of literature, I, I, 
I love the idea of understanding contexts, observing how others are, which means the way that they feel, not just the way they think. We tend to like to focus on competencies, for example, in business. Mm. I think really when you're looking at culture and mindset, the notion of feelings, manners, your ability to communicate uh, is so important and emotional intelligence within that. So it's, it's opened me up to hiring and, and having people like anthropologists and sociologists on my team because they absolutely provide distinct and valuable insights into the way we are, mm. not just hiring <clears throat> like-minded, competent individuals. Sometimes, you know, the anthropologists might say something weird. Okay, mm. so be it. That comes with the spectrum of differences you're going to allow in your organization and conversation. But there, that's what I think it's done for me. Mm. It, it, it's interesting because we we had um, a sort of a pre-podcast call a few weeks ago, and I, I typically do that with people that I've not met before. I didn't know you. We'd, we'd had some communication, and then we decided to have a conversation with you of, are we going to do a podcast? And I went back and I looked at my notes from that call, and the the two key words that I'd written down for you was authentic and open. And that came across very strongly. And now I saw that as being a really big, a big positive, A, as a podcast, but in just having this type of conversation. Mm. How, well, you know, what is, what does that, what do those words mean to you? And, and how important is that in business? All right, well, like, so often, authenticity is something you have to say. It's not something you say about yourself. No. I know that someone else talks about you. And, uh, and to say that I'm fully authentic or radically transparent would be inaccurate. Of course, I have times when I am not true to myself and there are times when I'm not fully proud of what I've done. So it's, it's never a perfect vision, which tends to come with this idea of authenticity. But the reality is it's about being able to embrace your imperfections mm. all the way up to and i'm not afraid to say it your death and once you've sort of embraced this notion of our finitude then you can be a more grateful about the present and and understand how absolutely little we are in this universe mm. and then that repositions the way we are as a boss it's like well what is it all about? It's actually all about relationships, enjoying the journey. It's not about getting the bigger house or the, the bigger check. And and because at the end of the day, you can't take that check or the house no. with you in your grave. So then then you when you reposition yourself as, as a small little numbskull in an enormous universe, then it just allows you to be a little bit more posed with your feet on the ground and understand what matters to you as an individual mm. and those around you. So that's what I would say about authenticity. It's, it's, it's interesting because in, in my work, you can see behind me, I've got two logos, one boss equity, which is my work for, with mergers and acquisitions and then outsmart, which is the strategic positioning for software companies and about how they communicate. With, with boss equity, one of the things that, that I've seen is that, um, and it may surprise people, I sit down with my clients when we have a sale mandate, the first thing that I ask of those shareholders and the founders is, what do you really want from this sale of the business? And it very rarely is money is the top priority. Money is always going to be in that top five very very rarely do they ever put it as number one they want to get the right value they want to get the right reward for all the hard work but there's usually two or three other things that come before that and one of those things is that the business is um something it's like a baby something probably that they've it started with an idea they they they, they were bold enough to say, I can turn this into a business. I can create something of value. They do that. They employ people. 
that are then looking for a career and they want to see the continuation of that business. They realize that they may not be the right person to take it beyond the stage that they're at. It may be that they're coming towards retirement. It may be that they've they've done it for 10 years and, and they've probably felt as though they've put everything that they can into it. It now needs somebody else. It may need a larger company. Um, it often is about giving the people within the company that have supported them often for many, many years, an extended career path of greater challenges um, and the structure of the deal, but money will often come three, four or five on those list of, of priorities. And I think that surprises quite a lot of people. It no longer surprises me. And then once they've sold that business, it's, they've got the ability because they've got financial independence to say, if they're not totally retiring, and I always say to people, if you've been very, very busy executive to suddenly switch off and do nothing, is, is actually can be quite stressful. Uh, and I've seen that. I've had clients who have said to me, they're gonna travel the world, they're gonna live on beaches for a while. Surprisingly, how quick they come back to me and say, what's happening in the industry? Is there anything I can do? Because they want to add value. And they are the things where you can do some good, where you can actually see that you're, you're, you're having a very positive impact in, within to an organization or for a group of people. Um, they will also get involved in charities and things. And I think that's, that's a very encouraging thing to see, you know, to see that aspect of human nature. Um, and is, it, is that something that you've seen or is that something that you've experienced yourself? You know, as you progress in your career, when we're younger, probably the fun, there are certain financial demands that we have upon us and it could be difficult to pay your bills. But typically as you, as you um, continue, the pressure's not quite as much and you get a little bit more freedom. All right, well, so I have a, a few things to say about that, as you can imagine, Mark. So the <laughs> first is when you're talking about an entrepreneur who's doing the business, Generally speaking, you're absolutely I, I, that's the same observation that it's not about the money. It can be, but it's not necessarily. No. The challenge <clears throat> is the people to whom you sell or the people from whom you get financing. Because generally, when you're in financing business, they are interested in the money. Mm. And so the issue then becomes how does that transfer? In other words, when you come at it from a lifestyle standpoint, or perhaps for a purpose that's bigger, solving a big issue problem in the world, and then you raise some money and you have these shareholders. How does that transfer into the shareholder mindset? And, and so the constructs there, according to the amount of control or ownership that you retain as the founder or entrepreneur or whatever, uh, and and then what are the the promises that go along with the way that the shareholder is going to invest and the exit that they're going to be promised and so on and so forth. Mm. So yes, absolutely. There's a there are other benefits and rewards that are looked for by entrepreneurs, but the as you say the growth model through, that's the tricky part, and and will they retain it? Uh, whether it's in a large corporate or in a financing world. Um, the, the idea of, um, of, of energy comes to me as important. When you, when you are uh, running this company and then you sell it, as you say, you then have this choice of doing nothing. The question for me at that point is, why were you in the business in the first place? And to what extent was it about you? I'm not, I'm not saying <clears throat> egotistically. No. To what extent was it a manifestation of who you are? Mm. So you might pavlovingly come back to the industry because that's the one you know best. But is it just because that's all you know? Or is it because it's a part of who you are? Mm. And there's a big difference there. The, the other challenge with people who are actively doing things, you have to work so long, to, you know, hard hours, you know, do the shit to get the business going and so on. Sure. You get used to being super busy. Yes. But the issue at that point is to what extent have you cultivated who you are? 
and move from just doing to being. Mm. And, and I, I, I make the same kind of revelation with regard to brand. You can either do the business, make the money and sell out. And then this is other thing called the brand, the trust, the je ne sais quoi about your company mm. that's bigger than just doing the business. And, and oftentimes we get so in the mold of just running around and doing the business that we forget to build the brand and let's say the identity and voice of the company, which hopefully if you're the entrepreneur is also inhabited within you and you can contribute to it. Mm. So these are, let's say sometimes up the pyramid in Maslow's pyramid construct, you gotta do the business, you have to have a great product. But to what extent are you building a brand? And to what extent is that part of who you are and the legacy you want to have as an individual on this earth? And so when it comes to that idea of leaving, often some will say, well, now I'm gonna give my money to charity because I have this money. I wanna do something that's important with the money that I earned. My impulsion is to think even in the way you earn the money in the first place, how can you contribute to who you are as an individual? How can you do the things you'd like to do in that, so to speak, charity right now? Because by the way, if you work so hard, you might run yourself to death. Yes. And, and there may not be time to do that charity. Mm -hmm. So why not get on the program now and do what you think is important within the context of your business? And by mm -hmm. the way, I'm not being radical or revolutionary. I'm not saying, you know, change from zero to 100% that, mm. but look at, try to integrate more meaningfulness and purpose into your business mm. that, that can, makes the world a better place and also allows you to manifest yourself within your business, not just by having a title of a CEO or a successful entrepreneur or 500 million in your bank account, mm. but because you feel like you are who you are and you're making a difference on this earth. Mm. Yes. I mean, that goes back to about being authentic, truly authentic to yourself. And you're absolutely right, is when I'm first introduced to a company, I, I get to know the founder, the senior executives within the business. And typically, the business will be built in the profile of that founder, if they're still really active within the organization. And from that, you can make certain um forecasts if you like as to what you will see further down in the business and that typically is quite accurate um, and i think the other point there is also is about the work-life balance um, where you can see where you can see executives that have other outside interests i think that is very very healthy it's also more engaging in dealing with those people you know mm. i love to talk to people about whatever they're passionate about even if I've got no interest in it, you know, if it's stamp collecting, but they're passionate about it, I love to talk to people about it. There's always going to be something there that's going to be of interest. And that sort of diverse input, if you like, which you can gain from other people, you can gain from, you know, you, your reading and, and, and your own hobbies and, and interests, but you can gain from other people as well, is great impact to the bit about creativity. You know, innovation and creativity can come from so many diverse other areas. And I think it's really important. We should yeah. takes us back to your background and, and my background to a certain degree, although not quite as long a list as yours, is having all of that history, you can draw upon that and that can help spark creativity. And creativity is really important. Um, in fact, we're putting together a course at the moment to help executives and people within the business to be more creative. I've done that in, in some of the things that I've done in photography and helping photographers to be more creative because there's a lot of photographers that they get very, very technical. And it's all about the equipment. And, and, it's, and it's about, you know, how you use the equipment. And they seem to leave that other part of the creativity and they don't believe they're creative. Where right? I think everybody can be creative. And within business, where you've got people that are really working full out all of the time, I think it can be hard to 
be creative because you've got to be able to stop and you've got to be quite objective and you've got to be able to take in other influences to come up with that that spark of what can make you very very different you know um, I, I, I have a couple i have a couple of things to say about that the yeah. first is to your point of stamp collecting and first of all stamp collecting is a great way to go around the world i'm just sitting on your desk looking at these stamps from yes. magyar or <clears throat> you know, black pennies and so on yeah um but more importantly within that comment is something that i i strongly feel but is not shared with everybody so it could be provocative Go is for that it. i i believe trust can only come from the entire person mm -hmm. so when i see somebody who doesn't have their home uh, in a good position that has an influence on who they are as an individual at work mm -hmm. for example they might be um single and and therefore they're going to be more dedicated to work and then they might ask the same of everybody at work because yes. they don't think about how it is to raise children or have a partner and think about them. In other words, empathy. Mm. And, and secondly, um, I'm going to tell a little story without naming who it is, but oftentimes you, you might hear a boss say, well, at my company, we're a family, you know, we're, we're solid long-term and all this, uh, whatever is your vision of family though, because I have a specific boss that I had who, um, who was married four children and um, also had two mistresses, one of whom I knew very well, who had severe mental health issues because of the way he treated her. Wow. And, and so you can say, well, that has nothing to do with who he is as an individual at work. He's a performing individual and smart as he is, sure. However, when he says, we are family at work, I raise my eyebrow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. And yeah. and so we we tend to want to say, well, you know, work is work. There's that boundary or the other thing, that private life. Yeah, sure. Your sex life, Mark, I don't need to hear about it. That's not the important point. But how you treat people outside of work, mm. that absolutely is part of who you are. And what you mm. do as an individual, whether it's stamp collecting, cultivating your garden traveling and learning languages that absolutely mm. adds to who you are. And so whether it's a private dinner party where I go out and hang out with you, Mark, and we can talk about shit, your great photography, for example, um, of course, lots of wonderful things we can do. And that contributes to who you are, your anthropology, sociology or whatever. Mm. And I fundamentally subscribe to that. So that's, that's what I'd like to add at this point. So if you're if you're working with with a business leader, how do you how do you approach that subject? How do you encourage them? Because I do know a lot of business leaders, and I don't see any aspect of them apart from work. They seem to be an almost sort of take pride in the fact they work long hours, they're one hundred percent focused on the business. And everything, every other aspect of their life seems to suffer. There, there has been a little bit of a culture of that, um, probably more in the past than I see today. And I think particularly with COVID, there's been a lot of other issues that have been brought to the surface and, and, and now are being discussed more openly, such as, you know, mental health, which I think is a great thing. Very, very positive. You know, even things like um, Tyson Fury, heavyweight boxer and the fact that he was he was able to be very very open and said you know i had a mental breakdown and he's now campaigning and talking to people you know i must admit when tyson fury first came on the scene in the early days and he was trying to create a name for himself his personality was not very endearing to me but once he became world champion and i think he realized he didn't need to do that anymore and you started to see that he'd had big troubles I mean, serious problems at the state of where he was, he was going to kill himself. And now he looked at life differently. He realized that that fitness and training helped to keep him balanced. And you saw about his family and so on. That changed my perspective on him. 
And I think other people then are able to step forward and talk about mental health issues. How do you approach, how do you discuss that with a, with a leader to, to help them if you see somebody who really is just 100% focused on the business? Because they're going to well, be perhaps to be a bit protect, a bit guarded. They might want to sort of fend you off a little bit on that. Sure. Well, you, you don't get into these topics lightly. No. And uh, <clears throat> someone who I don't know, doesn't know me, there's no reason why they'd want to, they still have their guards up. Mm. The, the for, for the way I approach it, Mark, is I generally want to solve their business problem. And so that we have an even keel, uh, open discussion with regard to their business. And, and if, they're, if we're having a conversation and they're having challenges, there's, of course, always business challenges. I want to grow faster. I want to recruit better people, whatever it can be. Within that, there's unlikely to be nothing revolving around the leader's personality. It can be about the culture of the organization, speed with which communications are happening, the behavior of certain individuals, the motivation schemes that have been put in place, obviously with his or her approval and so on. And so as you get into the understanding of whatever the strategic issues are, there is inevitably a cultural piece. And culture is all about language, behaviors, and, and rituals that you might have put in place, which come from somewhere. And, and uh, so that's the first point. The second one is, according to the relationship I get into with that individual, is try to understand what's important to them. And, and so they're the first ones, well, what's important is I succeed. Why is that important for you? And if you draw down the line of questioning, the chances are there's something deeply personal, deeply important for them that has nothing to do with the work that they're doing. Mm. And so you obviously get to it in, through different ways and different lines of questioning. And, and the, the, the desire is for me to get to a point where I can ask, so who do you want to be as an individual? What do you want your personal legacy to be? Mm -hmm. And of course, if they say, well, I want to be known as a dictator uh, of business and be a multi gazillionaire and that's it. Mm -hmm. And they're not interested in exploring it. They're not ready. No. And I'm not going to uncrack that nut. No, they probably need to see a shrink and certainly won't don't expect to have many friends mm -hmm. as they grow older that are, reliable because they're going to have friends in their ilk mm. built like that. Yes. You think that the only thing that counts is the size of my yacht and, and the, the age young of my girlfriend, for example, yes. so, so forth, right? They're not yeah. going to be into some deeper conversations about stamp collecting photography and other things that that's all they want. Well, so be it. I'm not here to change everybody mm. you need to, at some level, be open to it. And, and for me, the way I look at leadership and my, the whole thesis behind my last book is, if you understand who you are deeply, then you will become a better leader. And when I mean better, I mean, of course, more effective as a leader, but also a better person making for a better environment. Because if we have 70% of employees that year after year describe themselves as being disengaged at work, I think leadership is the root problem. And within that, both from a brand perspective, which I mentioned earlier, and from a leadership perspective, if you don't know who you are as an organization, as a brand, or as an individual, then what are you doing? All you're doing mm. is fitting numbers, trying to be number one. I mm. want to be number one. Be number one is not being. It's just a number. Mm. And when you're number one, then what? Who do you want to be? Also, how many people can genuinely be number one in the world? Well, apparently number one, only <laughs> one, right? Exactly. So that means there's going to be a lot of people who are going to fail on that by its very yeah, nature. So, and so often we have these vanity concepts and constructs. I, we're the underdog. That's who we are. Mm. Well, that's great. But, you know, why are you fighting? What are you fighting for? Mm. And uh, there's a... a great story about this pharmaceutical company that 
had this mission and they were very proud. And they said, well, we want to be the number one pharmaceutical company in the world in these categories. And the conversation went along. How about if we said, you want to be the number one for the world? Get it. Yes. Big, big difference. And, and so obviously language is important. I pay attention to that. And so when I'm chatting with somebody, I, I want to see the openness to the conversation. And, and according to, as long as we are still, because you need to do that, fitting the strategic imperatives and getting the numbers in, right? Opening us up to what it's all about. And, mm -hmm. and, and ultimately, of course, there's the, the, the strong benefits of being more authentic, aware of who you are, that's going to create greater trust, build better relationships, and probably as a result, gain better engagement from your employees and hopefully more business from your customers. Yes. So that's the journey that I try to bring through. Yes. That, that, that example, really good example, being number one for the world is definitely much more engaging and compelling for their customers, but also for the staff to be part of that movement. That is, without doubt, makes a big difference. There's a mind shift there. Mm -hmm. One of the things you mentioned was about being yourself and understanding yourself. And to me, that's one of the positives of, of getting older. Uh, I think I'd like to start the movement almost, which is this thing about everything about age is negative. We, we, <laughs> we tend to live in a world where um, being younger is always more positive. And I think that's a shame because I think that there are lots of very positive things that you gain as you get older. And one of those things is about truly knowing yourself and that can make life easier, more pleasant, more fun when you really do that. Um, but I think that there is also still ageism within organizations, not wanting to employ people of a past a certain age and that varies according to what that is. What are your thoughts about that, about age and in the workplace and in life generally? Because I do think that there is too much negativity um, and, and that is manifested in many different ways, is, is in the media and the fact that they're often presenting just younger people. Um, and you see it also in social media about people being depressed because they've reached the age of 30, for instance, and I think, you know, crazy, absolutely crazy. Um, so I think, think age is uh, an attitude and, mm. um, and there are some people way, you know, way older, too young. And, yes. and uh, when you get old, you can also be very furrowed and, and have a very typical type of mindset, which doesn't want to budge because, you know, I look successful look at everything I've done. And by the way, my habits have, have created these, these tracks in my brain, yeah. which I don't want to get derailed from. So you can, you can definitely find old and curmudgeonly. And so for me, it's really about wanting to stay uh, curious and, and, mm. and within that young at heart. So uh, within the ages, uh, if I'm looking at somebody and they're still trying out new shit. So uh, an example I like to take uh, just to be easy is, well, typically we have a telephone. That telephone's typically of a variety, Android or Apple, let's say, today anyway. <laughs> Probably some Chinese company tomorrow. Yes. Huawei. Um, you have, have you tried another one? And, and, and so if I'm on iOS, go pick up an Android and, and get, get comfortable with it. Are you still able to embrace change and have the curiosity to go and do it? I know it's a lot easier to use your iOS, mm. but go and check out an Android and figure it out. Mm. Uh, when, you get, when you pull on your trousers in the morning, do you, you typically use one leg when you do that? That's sort of how we are. We've been doing that for, in my case, 57 years. Well, shift legs, and specifically with your underwear, that's a lot more challenging. 
Yes. <laughs> do it do it at that level and and you'll find that kind of shift prepared to change learn to do new things old dog new tricks and so that's that's what i would say that's a good idea i can age. see that taking a simple habit and you're sort of almost telling yourself i'm willing to try things differently even with things as simple as that brushing your teeth with your other hand maybe yeah. but 97 percent of what we do every day is a repetition of what we've done in the previous days. Yes. And so we are creatures of habit and, and it's just the way we are. We go to bed at a certain time, typically. We do the first things we wanna do and we've been doing this now for so many years. Can we unwire ourselves? And do you have the attitude that wants to unwire? Another thing I would say, especially in these changing times is our ability to do, not just to say, mm. to say do. So in this world of tech, which we're living in, especially as you're getting up and, and, and leaders have this other challenge, which is they get basically sent into a little isolation pack, which is the head office. And, and nobody has the balls to come in and tell them what they need to hear. They tell yes. them what they think he wants to hear or she wants to hear. And we get isolated from reality. Uh, so what happens, for example, if, if we're not on social media, the chances are, as the boss, we will listen to the agency tell us what, how we should spend our money. Well, what you should do, Mark, is do this, this, and this on social media because it's really young and everybody loves it. And what you do is you, oh, okay, because you don't know shit. You don't know about the intrusion of the advertising in the middle of your mobile in your Facebook page because you don't bother about that. What you're interested about is the one way what I want. The business needs this. Mm. And you forget to look at it from the other side, which is the empathy piece with regard to the user experience or even the employee experience as a part of that. So, um, yeah, we need to do, the, do more learning. So experience the stuff, not just read about it in the Financial Times or Wired magazine, but actually mm. go out and, and, and figure out different virtual reality sets. I mean, I don't know how many you've done, but... I've done maybe a hundred different virtual reality journeys. So I have a good idea of what virtual reality is today, but Hey, you know, next year it's going to be different because we've got yeah. new stuff. So keep on wanting to check out the stuff and that's how you're going to stay young at heart and hopefully be able to contribute longer term into the business. On the other side, you've got young people who have already started, you know, listen, I already know everything or, Yes. And they want to run the world already. Well, yeah, actually, older people have experience and, mm. and there is value in that. I want to finish on one other point I just remembered, which is this notion of, of knowing who you are. Mm. And, and you said, when you get older, you, you finally get to know who you are. Here's what I'm going to say. Start earlier to get to know who you are. Part of our idea of getting to know ourselves, well, we now have the baggage to understand. When you're a two-year-old, you obviously don't know yourself. When you're a 10-year-old, 20-year-old, you haven't got enough to do. So you got to experience more things. But then what happens, I feel, is that too often we wait too late to lean into who we really are. Mm -hmm. Because there's this whole rat race that's from 30 onwards where we've got mortgages to pay for, perhaps family education to pay for and by the way if you do really well mark i'm going to promote you to be the senior manager of this and that <clears throat> mm. so that pressure well i better keep up with the rat race mm. and and very quickly i'm in the do do mode and i forgot to be who i am or figure mm. out who i am and so my encouragement generally speaking is to try to avoid having an nde a near-death experience which is the the thing we we face implicitly as we age mm. but until we have a life-changing moment we typically just stay on the pace and i'll get to that later so my encouragement is to do it earlier obviously you can't do it at the very beginning or it's very sure. unlikely you can do it at the very beginning but to do it earlier than wait for figuring out who you are at the age of 56 because in my case that would be too late i'd mm. be surrounding my people myself with people who I don't know because they don't know who I am and I don't know who I am. Mm. And, and you'll end up with this sort of false, uh, unattractive group. Mm. You, you are your network. 
and it may not be unattractive, but they certainly won't be representative of who you are mm. if you haven't done the work on truly, deeply who you are. Do you, do you think that the ability to be able to, as you say, take action on who you are and get to know yourself earlier, how much of that do you think is related to competence? It takes, well, to me, it seems to take a certain amount of confidence to be able to not just know who you are, but then act upon it. A lot of us are, are controlled to a certain extent by fear. How that's you, for sure. How do, we, how do we get that confidence? Well, I think we need to have fear. It's a very useful uh, and survival, good skill, survival skill. So confidence usually comes from your ability to do things. And mm. I, I think it's what's more interesting is just to try to figure out who you are. And, and the issue with that, A, is we, I don't have time to do it. So I don't allocate the time. I'm not strategic in my allocation of time. Like you were mentioning before about, you know, people very busy. Mm -hmm. I don't have the time to do that. No, 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 no. You choose not to do that. You have yes. chosen not to read. You have yes. chosen not to spend the time on who you are as an individual. Because if all you're doing is doing, mm -hmm. then you will not be able to succeed on being who you want to be because you don't know who you want to be. Mm -hmm. You haven't actually put that down. So it's about uh, being more intentional about it and recognizing that within yourself, you will obviously have things that are not perfect. And so the fear factor, sure. uh, A, is projecting us into our death, also in our ability to accept who we are as an individual, in our fuller self, with our imperfections, and by the way, dark side. If we're worried about that within ourselves, it doesn't mean you can't improve it, but the problem with that is that it, it will manifest itself in the way you are at work or at least within your relationships in the form of a chip on the shoulder or mm. something you will hide. And so as soon as you're in the hiding mode, you're not sure why, but you're not going to be clear with the way you express yourself. You're going to be shady. Yes. And who says shady? Well, <laughs> untrustworthy. Damn yes. it. You don't trust yourself. Yes. And therefore you're not going to be trustworthy in the eyes of other people you're certainly not going to be authentic in the eyes of other people. So this is the point is lean into this, try to spend some time, find the time, because if you know why it's going to be relevant, then you will find the time. And so the reason why it's important is that it will allow you to tap into more discretionary energy. Mm. Because if there's one thing that we're all limited by, it's our time. And so within our time, we also have ability to be more efficient and effective. And as you get older, what you realize is that we, we're not never ready bat battery. We do need to recharge. And the mm. way to recharge is to know why you're doing what you're doing. Yes. When it's you are inhabited by that, yeah. you jump out of bed and the shit happens because it doesn't matter. I know why I'm going to overcome the shit and the challenges. And that's just going to drive me and, and drive my energy. Yes. I, it's interesting. I, I was asked a question just a couple of weeks ago, and, and this was not related to business. This was related to fitness. And it was two 20-year-olds that were saying to me, I want to get fit. I want to go to the gym, but I can't get motivated. That motivation is my problem. And in giving them my answer, I actually sort of learned something myself, which I thought is, is a truism is I said to them, that's great. In the morning, when you're not motivated, you don't feel motivated, go anyway. Just get out of bed, put your gym stuff off and go when you're not motivated because you do that regularly enough, you'll find that the motivation will come. You will break out of that restriction of thinking, I've got to feel highly motivated all the time. And there are some times when you just have to say, I'm just going to go and do it because I know that it serves me. And actually what it will do is it actually feeds the motivation. You will find that that tends to flow. I found that when I was working and I was also a competitive triathlete and I was training twice a day, six days a week, I didn't feel motivated for every training session. 
getting up at half not. past five in the morning to go and dive in some cold water. There in were the a lot dark. of mornings. <laughs> yes, in the dark during the winter, and that's when you did a lot of the the the, the sort of the toughest swim training. I didn't feel motivated. But so. actually, by putting my clothes on, getting down there, I did feel a certain amount of positivity in the fact that I got out of bed. At least I've got here. I may not have the greatest session, but I did it step by step. And then when I was in the water, I thought, well, let, let, me, let me do the first 800 meters and see how I do that. And bit by bit, you piece together a good performance. And I think that that really can make a difference. I do hear too many people especially with fitness because i I've, I've learned a lot from sport and from fitness training that i've translated into the business world with sports you've got something that is very easily measurable you know if you're improving you know if you're wanting to lose weight or if you're wanting to get fitter you can have a time you can have a measurement a way of seeing that it improve you can in business but it can be more complicated so I've, I've translated a lot of the things that I've learned from sport and fitness into business. And I think that they do translate. And motivation is, is, is one that I think is spoken about too much or people don't really understand it. Once you get on and gain some momentum, motivation comes, but you're not always going to feel like doing it. All right. So I, with, with regard to the physical activity, I think that a, it's really useful to have physical activity, kinetic. Mm. We are human beings. We are made to move. If you want to move people, you need, have to, you need to be very kinetic about it as well. Mm. And, and there's that obviously the, the, the hormonal effect of, of doing workouts, which feeds back into something you'll appreciate. Here's the point that I like to, to bring up is that life is full of shit, challenges, and if you back down just because I uh, don't feel like it today, <laughs> well, you sure as shit aren't going to be preparing yourself for the real world. Mm. And, and parents have to be able to lean into this thought and override the, well, I only have one child. He or she is godlike to me. Anything they do is fine. They become 20th out of 20. That's great. Yeah. Uh-uh. We've got to we've got to understand mm. that that is not educating or preparing our child for a hard future. No, and so getting the reality the of life, isn't it? That's you, you've it. got to prepare them for the for the reality of life is competitive. Life won't always be fun, and we always have the fear factor as well, and and, and embrace that fear because if if you're fearless, well, watch out. That's yes, not necessarily that's right. good. Yes, uh, absolutely. I, the, the word one of I I did this film called the 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 Last Ring Home, and and for that film in the book, um, which is about the Second World War, I interviewed 130 veterans of the Second World War. Wow. And I didn't hear them saying I was, you know, motivated to go out and get killed <laughs> or shot. Right. Yeah. They, they had yeah. tremendous fear, but mm. they also had courage. Yes. And of course, not everybody who was in the armed services actually fought or shot a gun, but they also had a feeling, uh, particularly on the Allied side, but it actually within the Germans, that they knew why they were doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It may have not have been the right why, but knowing why you do what you do is so important too. So when you're 20, you may not know why. But by doing lots of things, exploring, experiencing stuff, and doing it, just try it. Because you will fail. By the way, that's part of life. And so you've got to get over those fears by, by jumping into the cold water, as you did in the mornings. And then you come back and say, damn it, I did it. Yes. And that's yeah. going to build my confidence because I tried stuff. I didn't hide yeah. away from it. Yeah, it, it, thinking about how you're going to feel after you've accomplished that is a motivator in itself. But you've got to go out and just do it sometimes. I've got I've got three final questions for you. Go. Um, the first one was just picking up on a topic we spoke about just before we started this recording, which was as a leader, how do you help your team to change when a change is needed within the business? How do you help people to change from a mindset, a behavior that they've always been doing? When you've got to get, as, as I mentioned to you, you've got to get all of the, 
the, the, the people within a company with their noses pointing in the same direction. Leadership is partly about that, is, is, is being able to portray the vision and then to get people on that path. How do you help leaders do that? All right, well, there is not a one, uh, one answer to that. I'm and glad you said that because <laughs> I see so much on the internet. If, if you want to be successful, this hmm. is the way to do it. But you'd have to wear a baseball bat, pat, hat on back to front to be saying that, yeah. by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I Typically probably American. Have yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> surely, as a Yank. Um, yeah. But r- reality is... Um, the, your context, your culture, where you come from, your history, all that is just supremely important. So that's why it's impossible for any specific answer. Though I would start with this. I think I believe in change happens at the top. Yes. And so if you're not prepared to exhibit the behaviors of change yourself, yes, uh, which will include a humility to know that you don't know everything, that you need yes. help, and you're willing to listen actively without being a bulldog boss who knows it all, and I'm the guy who drives the mission and vision and so on. All right, so that a shared, attitude, a shared journey with your with yourself. Yeah, yeah. So you get you you really are self aware. Yes. About who you are and and what your contribution is and so on. Then with with regard to the team. So uh, let me uh, circle back to an experience I had when I was running Redken. So this is a hairdresser, professional hair care brand based out of New York in 40 countries at the time and uh, about $350 million. And we said, well, we need, we want to uh, grow because we have imperatives that our shareholder is driving down into us. And so what we also want to do is do it in a meaningful way. And so we essentially, first of all, made sure that the executive team was on board. And, and are we prepared to do and be what we're asking of the rest of the team as a team? Because if we weren't aligned at the very top, the cracks show and that quickly falls through. And, and through that exercise with the executive team, where I had to demonstrate behaviors that showed that I was prepared to show up. Uh, Two of the people on the team self-identified themselves as not being prepared to do what it was going to take. Well, and that was really a very useful exercise. Mm -hmm. You're getting into the point where we're self-identifying, where we are uh, self-attributing our responsibilities. We're taking ownership of this at the highest level. Mm -hmm. And, and so one of the things we, we put in place was that everybody has an opinion at the table if they're invited. If they show up, what we require behind that is this. So we needed to model that at the executive level so that if we were talking about a marketing idea, the salesperson or the finance person or the HR person could have an opinion on the marketing thing. It wasn't just because the marketer was speaking about it, the godlike marketer, as L'Oreal likes to have. And that was called our board of governors uh, approach mm. to our executive team. And then we drew in basically 100, I think it's about 150 of our next level of team. And over three days, we concocted with them. And, and truly, we didn't have a, we had a roadmap for what we were going to discuss, but we did not know what the outcome was. Because the more you are tied to an outcome, the more that filter is going to show through in your language, you're going to be messaging, narrating, pushing for it. So that openness, that humility, and, and, and self-awareness will allow you with your team, if you, that's your mojo, to co-construct something. And uh, obviously you wanna consider the journey, but you don't want to know the destination because that's the fun part. And, and that means you gotta let go of control. You have to let go of certain fears you might have. And then you're gonna still be responsible by the way, because you're the head of the company. It's your head on the line at the end. However, if you've created an environment 
where you respect people's opinions and we are tru we're trusted adults. Yes. Because so often we get into this mode of fear and control because we don't trust our team. We, we tell them to do things down to the letter. And if you do that, they're straight jacketed. Yeah. You give them that liberties. You understand that each can contribute to it. Then you start molding this. And of course it wasn't the three day exercise, right? We, 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 we had certain things which we put in place. We asked then, and then we kept on coming back to that. And for example, about things we did as a team is that we, I, we were able to define the behaviors that we expected of each other. And that included in how we communicate, how we ran meetings, and how we showed up in general. And so what were the behaviors that showed that that was happening? And we were very explicit about that. And very importantly, we also said, well, what happens when that doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have that set up, mm -hmm. then it very quickly goes pear shape. Mm -hmm. and, and not only do you need to know what happens when that doesn't happen, you need to very quickly demonstrate the consequence right away and start yeah. getting everybody enrolled in that whole story. And that has to be top down. And so as soon as you start witnessing people either sugarcoating shit or not following that behavior, by the way, this isn't about some sort of military <clears throat> outfit. We were talking about things like love <laughs> and respect. Mm. And, and in our organization, we even had a, an unofficial director of love. And, and one, of, one of our rituals was, well, we had a, a way of shaking hands. And the way to shake hands was you actually had to have the two parts of your palm, uh, these V between your yes. thumb and forefinger meet. And the right. reason for that is that's a solid handshake. Yes. It's also because that's where the chakra of the heart is. And you have the chakras of the heart meeting when you shake hands. So you trust one another. It's a solid rugby man's handshake, mm. not some sort of wimp fish-like thing. Mm. We also had hugging. This is, of course, in an era where Me Too didn't exist. But mm. we did seven-second hugs. Hmm. In business, that is a long hug. <laughs> it's, it's, yes. Man, man to man. <laughs> woman to woman and man to woman yeah and here's the reason we we need to trust each other trust I what happens trust. actually is when you do long embraces there is science that shows that long embraces your heart starts to beat at the same time hmm. all right so that doesn't happen overnight you need to model the behavior and by the hmm. way we didn't hug all the time it wasn't just a hug a fest hmm. However, these were parts of the behaviors that we wanted to have in place and that we had rolled out internationally with all, and I being the head of the company, would go out to countries and there I was demonstrating the hugs with individuals around the world whose cultures are different. So I had to be respectful of that. But I said, well, this is how we roll. You don't mm. like it? That's great. So it's effectively fine. you were going on a hugging tour. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we would, I mean, we would do this to, I would, we had a bunch of, another interesting thing is about your brand, right? I mentioned brand. So these are elements of your brand uh, and the humanity of your brand. Mm. And so often we think of our brand as just a logo, you know, like a, a, a claim, or whatever. Yes. It's the humans bringing Much your brand alive. That. Yeah. Yes. And, and with us, what was fascinating was how to, make that brand come alive when it wasn't the employees. Mm. Because we all need partners. Uh, you know, even if you're like a mass marketing company, consumer goods product, you need Tesco, mm. right? Because they distribute or Amazon, whoever it is. Sure. So we all need partners one way or t'other. And in our case, we had, we were selling hair care and color to hairdressing hairdressers around the world. And obviously we had to have, we had sellers, distributors. Yes. So they were independent of us. So how mm. could we have them read that? Because a lot of them sold many other companies, many other brands. So why would they want to do it with us? And why? 
Well, and, and then we, we drilled that down into the hairdressers. Why? Because we had a purpose. And our purpose was earn a better living, live a better life. And we made sure, and I, leading from the top, had to make sure that that purpose was lived throughout the value chain, starting with me, my executive team, into the top 150 directors, and so on and so forth. So it's a process, the bringing that change around. It didn't happen overnight, but I can tell you that when you do an authentic purpose like that, at the time, we were the number five company in the hairdressing world worldwide. Today, we're the number two. I'm not aiming to be number one, or you saw, you know, I left the company bloody hell a long time ago. Mm. But what I'm showing is that by having a deep rooted sense of purpose that's distinct and felt lived, it can actually also be extremely profitable and successful. Mm. That's, that's my main message. It's not to aim to be number one. And you know, success is great. But if you're doing things to move the world to make the world a better place, that's greater. Excellent. They're a really good example, I think. I think they're Minter and um, makes it uh, come alive so people can understand that. But I can see how the staff could get behind that um, with that overall program. What in your business life have you been most proud of? Well, um, I, I funny, I have a small story. I'm going back to my beginning days at L'Oreal. And I was, uh, I came out of business school. So I was kind of a little bit like the spit and shine officers look like in the army, someone who doesn't know what they're doing because they're just a business MBA. Hmm. And, um, and I was on in marketing and, and um, we were launching a new product. L'Oreal is, is a very product centric, very proud of their R and D. And we had this new hair loss product. And um, I was charged with, creating the launch, the, the whole strategy and everything. And, and I came up with this idea of creating a product that was something like five, maybe six times more expensive than any other product we'd ever sold. So, you know, some imagine being, you know, a, a car manufacturer, average price selling price of 20,000, and then all of a sudden we're gonna go with 120,000. Right. In the all right, so I put that in cars, but in, in our <clears throat> world, it was a hairdressing product. And so instead of sure. selling shampoos at 10 or 12, 15 pounds, we're up in, in the 60, 70, or in this case, 100. And, um, and I was very proud of that because I had to do two major things. First of all, I had to persuade our entire internal management team on the, on the groundedness of this idea. And so we made a box of 42 files of this, of six milligrams of this little liquid, this gold that we had created. And that was a, a big deal. And then you was selling the sales team and getting them on board and so on and so forth. But the other one was the manufacturing company. Because mm. all of a sudden, instead of having fast flowing, easy fills, we had this fiddly pain in the butt, change the manufacturing line line. And so it was also about bringing on board the, the manufacturing team into the vision behind it. And, and why I'm still proud about that is that I still see the box of 42 being sold in headroom right. salons 25 years later. Well, wow. So the point is that sometimes having that courage of conviction yes. uh, is so important. And, and you, you know it's an uphill battle. The easy thing would have been to just do as we've always done. Mm. But sometimes you need to be prepared to stand out, take the heat and, and think of the story though, because if you, and, and, and humanizing that story and bring it to the entire value chain, in this case, the distribution also needed to be changed. It was a pain for them to carry it, a big box, of course, the sales teams, the hairdressers, and so anyway, that's the, um, that's one thing I'm proud of, I would say. Excellent. And I think that's, um, that covers many of the topics that we've, we've, we've discussed on this podcast, which is really nice. And finally, what's a personal achievement that you've been most proud of? Oh, well, that's easy. I, I mean, and I'm not going to go corny on you. Um, the personal uh, is this journey that I, I was on for 25 years. And it was to discover who 
were my grandfather and grandmother, both of whom died before I was born. And, and specifically, uh, the, my grandfather was named after him. He was killed as a prisoner of war of the Japanese in the Second World War. And, and it was a, an opportunity to obviously uncover his life through the documentary film, which is on television, History Hip TV, if you, if you know that. And, um, and also to, to understand what they went through and to give thanks and be really, truly, deeply grateful for the freedoms that they fought for to give us. And when you interview 130 veterans, the Second World War, uh, nearly 100 of them were prisoners themselves. You understand that we are truly privileged individuals to be living in the type of life we have. Mm -hmm. and what they went through, we can learn from the values that they espoused. Of course, I'm not being reactionary, but boy, did they have a, a, a higher sense of honor. Mm -hmm. They had a form of courage that we could do a lot more of. And they also had a form of love that was is very deep. And, and uh, in the story, it's called The Last Ring Home. I, I, um, there's a lot of work that was done and why I'm proud of it is also that it was a story that was a family secret. And, and so I, through the story, I was able to, let's, let's say, do some work with allowing the family to understand what happened the, and, and uncovering the challenges that come from not having a father that returns from war and the, the damage that, that comes from that. And, and, uh, and let's say not, not necessarily healing, but coming to terms with what all that was and what was not said in the family. And I think that as men, you and I, we're generally not good at sharing emotions. True. And, and what I've, first of all, I, through the journey, I came to understand myself better. I also allowed my father to understand himself better mm. and, and allowed us to cry and allow us to, to recognize our own humanity, our imperfections. And, um, and hopefully the film, the book, allows other people to, to, to understand that as well. Because we, we, it's life is short. We need to cherish it, we need to cherish people we love. We need to be able to accept our emotions and imperfections. And, and that's what that journey has been about. And uh, I, I just had the film on uh, television in America nationally. And I get all these messages from people who've seen the film. These are total strangers. And it's so rewarding to see how people feel moved by the story. Tell me how they want to do the same thing and or uh, need help in finding out about their family, some member that didn't come back and so on. So. Yeah, that's what I'm most proud about on a personal level. And you should be. Great way to uh, finish the podcast today. Um, thank you very much for your time. I've, I found the, the conversation fascinating, and hopefully people listening into the podcast will do too. Um, but a great story to, to end this. And uh, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you very, very much for your time. It would be useful um, if you could send to me some contact details that we will post when we do this podcast. And also, did you say that the film was called The Last Ring Home? Yeah. Great title. Great title. And if somebody wanted to watch that, is there a way that they can do that? Because we, we talk, we're, we, you know, this goes out to people in different countries. Is there a website or is there somebody where we could send people to perhaps just find out information about it? Yeah. So the, uh, my, my main website is thelastringhome.com. It's uh, forward slash film, and you can find it's on YouTube, on VOD, Apple oh, TV, great. Amazon, in some countries, not all countries, and on History Hit TV until I think the end of July. Uh, that's the English uh, Dan Snow channel. But also the book, of course, is available on, on uh, Amazon and other places. It's a story about a ring and, and the ring's incredible journey, because that's actually the eye opener. Like how a little object can mean so much uh, and, and yet be worthless otherwise. Mm. 
Well, fantastic um, podcast today. And as I said, this was the, the final podcast for me with season two. The next one, I'm going to start season three, which is going to be, there's going to be some changes. It's going to be more visual. But um, thank you for your contribution because you like a good, strong end. And I think that's been just that today. So just going on very quickly, just talking about season three, I've got my example of my brain here. In season three, we're going to be talking a little bit more about cognitive science within the software sector. We're going to be talking more about um, M&A and bringing to you more guests. But I also want to hear from people regarding what have you enjoyed from season one, season two? What have you not enjoyed? What would you like to see more of? And, and be creative. I'm, I'm all ears at the moment. So anything that uh, might appeal to you, just let me know. But until then, I would say, listen, be authentic and stay safe. Thank you very much.